Welcome to the Filthy Heathens Podcast. My name is Kirk. we got a great show for you today. What I'm going to be going over mostly today is Joe Biden. He's our newest president of the United States. Um, he's got a, a lot of things going on right now, which are really concerning, but you know, not unexpected to have some sort of like getting used to the office, even for someone who's been in the White House for a number of years, who's been in government for a number of years, there's going to be some some issues in the first uh, month or so, a couple of months. But this is pretty weird what's going on with him over the last, uh, well, let's see here. He's been in office for only about five weeks, so it's pretty pretty solidly crazy. So I'll stick mostly to him uh, today on the show, and then to make things so we end things on a light note, I'm going to go over something uh, kind of fun, just going to go over a video game that gives my I give my full recommendation to, so I'll go over that towards the end. But let's go ahead and get started, and I want to talk about Joe Biden. Uh, so Joe Biden is the President of the United States at this time. Uh, so Joe Biden recently this week he launched an airstrike. He ordered an airstrike on a target in Syria. So for me personally, I I look back on on military actions that I've supported in the past. I did support the war in Iraq at the time. You have to remember at the time too. I was in my early twenties. We had we were about a year and a half after nine eleven. You know, my blood was still boiling from that, and Saddam Hussein did look like a, an issue that just needed to be solved at that time. Unfortunately, we solved that problem and then created more more problems. So uh, I'll admit that that did not turn out like I hope, and I was I was wrong on that as far as how to uh, how to go. I think at the time, with the information we had, it was the right decision. Looking back on it now, it was definitely not the right decision. However, and you know Donald Trump, he uh, his first couple of months in office, he also launched an airstrike on Syria. I I was confused about that, but I then remember him saying that hey, there was a chemical weapons attack, so there was some sort of justification for it. There was a couple uh, chemical weapons. Chemical weapons are not okay, so you launch an attack to. To kind of say, hey, that's not okay. Just to make sure that it's the message is clear. So you are sending a, a message. Unfortunately, those messages cost lives, and you 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 better have a solid justification for for military action like that. So for me personally, if you give me a good enough justification, though, I'll go along with some with just about any military action as long as the justification is good enough. For example. Like I said, Trump said that there was uh, there was a some sort of chemical weapons attack that happened at that time. Okay, fine. If that's the case, and you want to either destroy the ability to launch those chemical weapons, or you want to destroy the chemical weapons facility where they are created, whatever the case may be, I get it. You want to do that? That's fine. I get it. Same thing when it came to me supporting the invasion of Iraq. At the time, we had. Even the countries that did not want us to invade uh, Iraq, they said Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. So it wasn't like, you know, basically everybody who, who guessed correctly that that was not true, they were lucky. Okay, because 50-50, you either had him or he didn't. So congratulations, you, you, you won a 50, you, we won the coin toss. So if you give me though a good enough justification, I'll go along with a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of things. Apparently, Joe Biden though is is saying that there was the murder of a civilian contractor in Syria, and I'll I'll take him at his word that that's the case. That this strike was mostly about retaliation. You cannot kill um, either American citizens or people working uh, for the United States government. He, that's not okay, you know, without some sort of retaliation. I get that. But my issue with the strike isn't necessarily that it happened. There are some uh, Middle Eastern concerns that I'm afraid how this will work because we know Joe Biden wants to make nice with Iran, 
even though it makes absolutely no sense after Trump's all the Trump uh, the Abraham Accords and all the other peace deals that Trump just signed in the last year. Israel is our greatest ally in the region. They have peace treaties now with Egypt, Jordan, I believe it's here. What's the other ones? Uh, United Arab Emirates. They have uh, Sudan. They have a... Uh, what's the other? I think... There's another one with Morocco, which is technically not in the Middle East, but it's a Muslim nation in you know North Africa. So that is a big deal. You know, there was all of these peace deals that went out um, last year, and that those peace deals were able to kind of isolate Iran, so that they were they were basically the entire rest of the Middle East was saying, "Hey, if we have to decide between Israel and Iran, we're going to choose Israel," and that's basically what was going on. So I'm a little bit concerned that this strike is actually more of a a problem messing with those things, you know, messing with with our other the other, you know, peace agreements that uh, were negotiated under prior administration. So that concerns me. Uh, However, I think I, I think for the most part, that won't mess things up too much. My my other concern is. You have to realize that whenever you're attacking Syria right now, there's a chance that you could be causing problems with Russia because Russia is a a major ally of Syria. They have the backing of Russia. Under no circumstances do we want a hot war with Russia or China. I mean, those are the two. The, if if you had to choose two countries in the world, we don't want to go boots on the ground war with. It's Russia and China. Now, not to say that we wouldn't win, but the last thing we want right now is a hot war with nuclear uh, powers. We just don't want that. So, if there's going to be any risk of war, you better damn sure make sure you have let the Russians know, hey, this is in retaliation for this. We're doing what we can to limit civilian casualties. We are trying to limit casualties altogether, but this is going to happen. So there are channels that you can go through to make sure this works out. So I'm a little bit concerned that it's escalating potential problems with Russia, which we don't want to deal with that. Also, I'm wondering where all the anti-war Democrats went. When I was in college, every Democrat was against war. Like, almost at... It was almost to the point where they would gladly surrender to any country that attacked us. Or any any ideology that attacked us. You know, So, I'm wondering where all of those anti-war Democrats went. Because they're nowhere to be found now. Striking Syria right now is exactly what we were we were complaining about the war in Iraq was. The war in Iraq was supposedly a war for oil. Well, right now, if I, I'm not sure how much you can count this as a conspiracy theory, but right now there is a a push to build a pipeline, an oil and natural gas pipeline from Qatar, which is on the Persian Gulf, to Turkey. So, the Qatar-Turkey pipeline. Well, the main plan of that goes through uh, Saudi Arabia, and to get to Turkey, it goes straight through Syria. That's the plan that wants to be used. So, if there is a war, and the United States goes to war in Syria, that is directly, that, that is legitimately a war for oil. Like, legitimately. No no ifs, ands, or buts. If the United States goes to war in the Middle East, and it's in Syria, I guarantee it's going to sound the same as when Bush invaded Iraq. I get it. It's going to sound exactly the same. Oh, we're trying to liberate. Um, there's, uh, there's, ma- there's weapons of mass destruction. There's chemical weapons there. It's going to sound exactly the same. We're, and we heard all of this almost 20 years ago. It's going to sound exactly the same. The only difference is, is that this time around, it is legitimately a war for oil. That is really the only reason. Because the interests are there. 
the plan is to have this pipeline go in because th and here's the reason the reason russia doesn't want this to happen they're they're siding with syria they don't want this pipeline to happen because right now europe is kind of dependent on russian oil and natural gas for for energy so the energy that's not being uh taken care of from nuclear wind solar all you know all the green stuff the green energy stuff that they have over there all the all the fossil fuels that they're using is mostly coming from russia well what they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure that okay well let's get that middle eastern oil and the best way to do that is get a pipeline from uh from qatar to turkey and since turkey is a nato ally that helps out turkey as well which there's a whole thing to go into about turkey turkey they're a nato ally but they're also a their their leader is i mean he's if he's not a dictator he definitely wants to be one it's it's pretty bad so this whole thing is meant to make it easier for our european allies to get oil and natural gas without having to go through russia so it's so there's all of that going on there's the interests and again that helps us in the u.s because it does diminish russia a bit even though russia is not a big a threat to us as china is i i, I have well we know china owns joe biden so that's not a you don't have to go there but what we need to realize is that if we do the bottom line of this if we go to war in syria with boots on the ground which here's the thing we were talking about doing that back when we invaded iraq we were done. We we had conquered Iraq in what two weeks, maybe less, and there was talk of why don't we just go to Syria now? Why don't we just take care of that right then and there? There was talk at that time. Why don't we just go in then? We were already there. We had two hundred fifty thousand troops. Syria is a pretty small country. There, the borders really porous between Iraq and Syria. Why not just go there? Um, it's probably a, a that would probably be a big help to Israel as well. So there was talk back then. So it's not like this hasn't been on the table for 20 years. But this is the bottom line: is if we go to war in Syria, this is the definition of a war for oil. 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, everybody was saying Iraq was a war for oil. Well, gas prices skyrocketed to almost five bucks a gallon after that war for oil so that was bullshit this time it legitimately is because there is a legit pipeline planned to go straight through syria and i guarantee that that thing gets done in months if we invade syria that's going to just go right through and make it happen so i don't know what joe biden is really doing honestly i don't think he knows what's really going on i mean He's given some speeches in the meantime that, that say he's actually stopped in the middle and go, what am I doing here? I mean, this guy has the nuclear codes and he's asking in the middle of the speech, what am I doing here? So go look it up. It has happened. <laughs> so I'm a little bit concerned. And here's the thing is at least a war for oil would make sense. Why is he, why is he launching strikes right now in Syria? Because if he's trying to start a war... That would that would be a a logical thing to do. I, I'm not saying it's a good thing to do. I I really hope we can stay out of another war in the Middle East. We've had enough wars for 20 years. I supported both of our forever wars that we've had over the last 20 years. I supported them when they happened. I supported them for the first 10 years after they started, and I'm over them now. It's like, okay, it's been 20 years. These countries, now it's time to like let them go completely. They need to figure it out. So m my little bit of conspiracy theory here is that these strikes in Syria is Biden's attempt to wag the dog. He has had a terrible awful first month in office the first day first day he's in office he kills ten thousand jobs by canceling the keystone pipeline what a moron but that's something that the far left and 
most of his party wants. So I kind of knew that was going to happen. And I think anybody who voted for him in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, uh, any basically any of the Midwest states, I mean, if you voted for him and you didn't think he was going to do that, you're an idiot. So that's your own damn fault. However, I think this is, if, if I'm going to put my, my tinfoil hat on, this is him wagging the dog. It's not just him that has had a bad first month of his presidency. His party is having a terrible first month being in, in complete power of the elected branches. They, it's awful <laughs> how bad it is. So let's just start here. I mean, Anthony Cuomo, the governor of New York, motherfucker got an Emmy for for his news briefings on covid and hollywood said oh he is america's governor he is he is gave us the leadership they weren't getting from the white house he fucking killed grandma and they were complaining about killing grandma he killed grandma and at the same time he was killing grandma and covering it up he apparently <laughs> was sexually harassing his female members of his staff now when it comes to sexual harassment, sexual assault, things like that, I, I'm i very hesitant to call somebody uh, a rapist or a sexual predator or anything like that because, I, first of all, there have been too many hoaxes over the last, you know, at least, especially since I got out of college, there have been way too many hoaxes. But at the same time, it is such a, it, it is it is such a horrible offense like a legit version of sexual harassment and i don't mean just like maybe you said an inappropriate comment i mean like you're touching and and you know physically getting involved with somebody who doesn't want it obviously maybe they're married maybe they have a long-term relationship you know this stuff it's uh you know it i'm very hesitant on that so we'll we'll stick with the allegedly for Cuomo, um, sexually harass some some female staffers, but in you know it's really just because it's if you're going to accuse somebody of that, that is I mean that's worse than being you know that's worse than the racist label. I mean in in a lot of ways it's worse than the than the murder label. I mean it's it's really bad. So I'm I'm gonna hold off on that for now, but. These are two big scandals affecting the biggest figure, the, the, the most recognizable figure of the COVID era in the Democratic Party. It turns out he was horrible at his job. He killed grandmas and covered it up. And now you have two situations, two women who have come forward and said that they were sexually harassed by him. And, you know... That's a, I mean, that's something that you might want to get off the front pages. I mean, most of the Democrat media, like CNN and MSNBC, haven't really covered it at all. Um, they're, you know, they're running the smokescreen for Cuomo and the Democrats, so they're doing their job. But it's not just Cuomo. Cuomo's not the only problem. Gavin Newsom's going to get recalled in California. I live in California. Gavin Newsom's going to get recalled. So. There's going to be an election. Now, right now, based on what I'm seeing for polling data, Gavin Newsom would, would, not get, would not actually get recalled. He would not actually get kicked out of office. But here's the thing. Is, and especially since so many Republicans have left the state, it's, you know, it's going to be kind of hard. But leading up to an election, there are going to be months of Gavin Newsom did this. Gavin Newsom did this. Gavin Newsom didn't do this. Remember, Gavin Newsom also sent nursing home patients or recovering COVID, um, people recovering from COVID back into nursing homes. So Gavin Newsom also did that. So Gavin Newsom has made a bunch of gaffes, a bunch of problems for himself during COVID. The day after he he told everybody to, to stay home, you know, don't go out. And ordered restaurants to close down. He's seen with members of the California Health Board and his family at a a very fancy restaurant. Let's put it this way: I could not afford to take my wife there if I didn't save up for a few months at least. 
I couldn't take her there for our anniversary. And I'm just a regular guy doing a regular job, making a, a regular amount of money. So it is a very high class restaurant in the Bay Area. He, he was there with a whole bunch of people, no masks, nothing. So while he's locking down other people's businesses, while he's telling people to stay home, while he's telling people to wear a mask and do all these other stupid things for COVID, and one of these days I will go over COVID. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm I'm trying to figure out how I want to really word it because COVID pisses me off in so many different ways. But while he's doing all that, you know, while he's telling all of us to do that, he's going to these fancy restaurants and and pretending that COVID doesn't exist. Same thing. Remember, Nancy Pelosi had the same thing. She got her hair done in violation of the the California lockdown orders you know so you have plenty of uh democrat politicians who obviously don't think COVID is that big of a deal except to score political points it's the whole reason they were able to beat donald trump in the last election they would have got destroyed if it wasn't for covid so so there's a lot of problems going on within the democrats right now and the media does want you to think that there's bigger problems with the republican party that's not the case right now as far as scandals because the Republican Party, they have an issue, and the issue is Trump. And it's how much do we accept Trump as part of the Republican Party? Is he is his style, is his are his policies, are they the future of the Republican Party? Or are they kind of this blip in the Republican Party? Or is there kind of a happy medium? So that's where the, the civil war is, civil war in the in the Republican Party. It's just it's basically how much are we going how much of Trumpism are we going to keep overall in the party and in the conservative movement in general. So remember, Trump was a Democrat until about ten years ago. So it it's not like he's this bastion of uh of conservative virtue. However, there are a lot of he did govern the country as conservatively as as I've ever seen in my lifetime, at least. So it's uh, that's the civil war in that party. But if, like I said, if I was to put my tinfoil hat on, it wouldn't surprise me if Joe Biden legitimately launched these strikes in Syria to kind of take the uh, the pressure off of his political party right now to kind of move the the focus away from Andrew Cuomo killing grandma. Andrew Cuomo uh, potentially sexually harassing members of his female staff, and Gavin Newsom on the, you know, on the chopping block potentially for, uh, for his job. So there's a lot going on right now, and these uh, these airstrikes don't they don't seem right at this time. So and the justification while. Obviously, you have to respond to the murder of a uh, an American contractor. There is something the justification just doesn't seem right. So that is my tinfoil hat thing, as far as you know, a political party standpoint. The other thing is that again, the airstrikes could have been to to drive away from that, but Joe Biden. Joe Biden has had a horrible time trying to get some of his bigger, higher profile appointees through their confirmation hearings unscathed. Now, he's had a few successes, so that's, I mean, that should be expected. Uh, you usually put people into positions that are non controversial uh, to kind of get some wins. So most of the people you put in office are going to. Are going to just skate right through it's like oh okay this person's uh you know this person's going to be attorney general um you know are they a lawyer they were attorney general for a state or you know like bill barr who i think was attorney general before you know things like that these are people that generally will skate through so you do that um so that you can get that worked out however the the high profile ones are not skating through and they are awful they are doing terrible in their confirmation hearings the the first one 
is uh, Xavier Becerra. Now, Xavier Becerra, I have I happen to know a little bit about him. He's the Attorney General of the state of California, the state that I live in. Um, he is a garbage, garbage human being. Uh, he's just terrible. He's up there. I mean, it, he's not as bad as Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris was my senator for a while. Um, she's she is a garbage human being. But uh, Xavier Becerra, he is terrible. He, first of all, he's the Attorney General of California. Now, if Barack Obama, or not Barack Obama, but if Joe Biden had appointed him to be Attorney General of the U.S., I still wouldn't like it, but that would make more sense. This is a guy who's been Attorney General. He is a lawyer. I mean, there's, uh, you know, he's been the top cop in a state. It would make more sense to go that way. But he's being positioned to be the head of Health and Human Services. He has no qualifications. He's not a doctor. He's not uh, in, I mean, he's he, his practice as a lawyer was never in the medical field. And it, it's just awful. I mean, I, he has no qualifications whatsoever. And that's been pointed out. That he has no idea what he is he, really what he's going to be doing as Secretary of Health and Human Services. I mean, he he'll he'll he will be awful. So there's there's nothing there. there there's no qualifications for this at all. So people will say, oh well, Ben Carson. You know, Trump chose Ben Carson for housing and urban development. Ben Carson grew up in a ghetto. He grew up poor. He grew up in these these uh you know. Uh, these HUD, you know, how these HUD houses, these, you know, basically these uh, public housing complexes, he grew up there. So he knows from experience what it's like. So he can go and communicate with people in those, in that situation and find out, hey, what can be done to make this better? And how do we make that work? So granted, he's a, he's a neurosurgeon. So what does he know about housing and housing policy? But from an experience standpoint, He's going to know the, the general plight of people and know the problems that they're going to see. However, Xavier Becerra has none of that. He has no qualifications whatsoever. And that's been called out several times. He uh, also, his only real, I mean, and uh, he's just been lambasted for this. I believe Ted Cruz said, hey, besides, you know, besides suing nuns, what do you know about healthcare? Healthcare, Because... That's all he's done is he sued nuns. So because this uh, this Catholic charity would not provide birth control for nuns. Yes, that is a legit thing that happened. He sued nuns because they wouldn't provide birth control to nuns. Now, maybe Xavier Becerra thinks that nuns are disingenuous and some of them might get pregnant but that's not where you start the assumptions for policy so there's that on top of that he has supported abortion uh stances that are just egregious and to have somebody with this radical, and I hate using the word radical. How about just atrocious? That's kind of an old-fashioned word. What's a better word? Um, psychotic version of, of pro-choice is it, we can't have that person in charge of our health care or health, health apparatus in the country. That is just awful. He, let's just go over a few of them. He supports partial birth abortion. Okay, so he's okay with partly delivering a baby. Remember, a baby that's come to full term and shoving a pair of scissors into its skull. That's what partial birth abortion is. So he's okay with that. He's voted against any kind of restrictions against it. Um, Xavier Becerra used to be a a congressional representative from California and he voted against any kind of restrictions on partial birth abortion. So that's just awful. 
uh, going back to the whole nuns thing, he opposed, uh, basically he sued Little Sisters of the Poor because they were not providing birth control to the nuns that worked in the charity. So he's, that's his real claim to fame is he sued nuns. He has uh, gone after pro-life activists. So there was a case in which uh, there was video footage that showed Planned Parenthood selling uh, the remains of aborted babies. So even though that was against the law in the state of California, rather than try to prosecute the Planned Parenthood clinic, or at least the staff there, he went after the people who, who discovered it. So basically, he will go after investigative journalists before he'll go after baby murderers. So, I mean, people violating the law after they kill babies. I mean, that is, I mean, so there's that. He is also, when he was in Congress, he voted down the Hyde Amendment, which is, it's basically, it's a federal provision that states that Medicare, uh, I think it's Medicare or Medicaid, one of the two, they can't be used for abortions. So basically no, no public funding, no federal funding to abortions. So you can't, the actual abortion is not going to get funds for, for, uh, from the federal government. So he said he supports using federal dollars to perform abortions. And, I mean, if you just need to top it all off, he has a perfect rating from Planned Parenthood. Uh, yeah, Planned Parenthood, which is just an abortion mill. It's it's pretty terrible. So, he's, he's a... T- and when he was asked about any of this stuff, he was just terrible. He didn't answer very well. He evaded every question possible. He, he was terrible in the confirmation hearing. So, I hope he gets... Uh, I hope he gets, you know, I hope Biden has to replace him because I hope he doesn't get through. Uh, he was probably the worst example as far as just why are you being picked for this? The uh, the next problem is actually uh, Dr. Rachel Levine, who was being who's being touted for assistant uh, director of health and human services. So assistant secretary. For health and human services. So what a lot of people don't realize is that, yeah, you have the big person, the person that is the, the secretary of these, these cabinet positions. So health and human services, uh, you know, secretary of state, secretary of defense, all, all that. That's all well and good. But the people who really create policy and implement policy and really they write the regulations and everything like that, they're the assistant uh, the assistant secretaries and sometimes the assistant to the assistant is is a big deal as well. Well, Rachel Levine was obviously brought in so that they could do the whole, we hired a trans person. Yay. The problem is, is that you need to go back and I'm going to, I'm going to post links in the, in the video descriptions, go back and watch Rachel Levine's a just awkward interchange with Rand Paul, um, Senator Dr. Rand Paul, <laughs> so, or Dr. Senator Rand Paul, whatever. Um, Rand Paul asked her a specific question, and y'all go ahead and say her, you know, if, if that's what if that's what dude wants. Um, I'll go ahead and say her. Now, she said, she was asked a specific question, is should children who have not reached the age of consent, be able to change their sex? Is that a decision that we should be allowing for uh, for minors? That is a very straightforward question, and she evaded it completely. I think it was like five times he went over and kept asking a different way. Okay, let me try it this way. Let me try it this way. You evaded the question. And she just kept ignoring this is, I mean, this is a problem. Now, if you look online, what you'll see is that Rand Paul is a transphobe, and they'll they'll compare, uh, they'll compare the sex change surgery to circumcision. So, yeah, why can't a child choose their their gender? They're the one choosing it. You're okay with circumcision, 
And it's like, well, first of all, if you're comparing, I, I want you to think about this, a male to female transition. I mean, if, if you, <laughs> I mean, that's a lot more mutilation of the genitals by far than, than a circumcision. That's number one. All right. Number two, I mean, yeah, by far it is. I mean, you're basically at that point, you're trying to compare a haircut to a, to a guillotine. I mean, that's, that's really what you're doing. If that's your, your biggest, you know, thing. It's like, oh yeah, well, what about circumcision? It's like, no, there's a, the, the mutilation of the genitals that goes on for a sex change operation is much worse. So there is that, but could not answer, you know, should a minor be doing this? You know, we don't let children choose what school they go to. We don't let children drive. You know, they can't, they can't be responsible for those kind of decisions. I mean, I barely let my kids decide what clothes they want to wear. I mean, what, we're not letting them make these decisions. We have an age of consent. If somebody is too old and they are having sex with somebody who is too young, that's against the law. We have all of that, but we're going to tell somebody who's a five or six year old, yeah, you can change your gender, even though it flies in the face of biology, it flies in the face of just basic science and it, and it's a, it's a gruesome transition process. You're talking about giving kids puberty blockers so that they can't go through and develop as a person. And not only that, but you're allowing somebody to make this life-altering decision at an age when the statistics show that if you let them go through the whole, the whole thing, in most cases, and by most, I mean over 95% of these people, it is an actual phase. They just kind of like, you know what? No, I'm, you know, now that I've kind of hit puberty and I've gone through life, it, it is what it is. I am a little bit concerned on the trans issue because it reeks of homophobia as well it's it's there's something about how it's i think it's mostly when i see it, it's mostly from parents when their their kids start you know their boy starts showing a bit more feminine traits or something like that or their their girls a bit more a bit more tomboyish and it when you when you talk to parents or you see parents that go about this I think there's a little bit of homophobia there because I think they're they're wanting their kid to oh it's like well maybe you're oh you're maybe you're a girl then maybe you know because they don't want to deal with the you know what what if he's gay it's like I would much rather my son be gay than tell him he should chop his dick off so you know there's there's that okay I would much rather my daughter be a lesbian than for her to completely ruin any chance she has to have kids at a later date because I let her decide her gender at a at an age where she had no business when she basically didn't have a dis, you know any business deciding what she wanted from McDonald's. So there, the fact that this uh, this person is can't answer basic medical questions from someone who is a doctor when they're in going here it's i mean that's another that's strike two i mean at health and human services for for joe biden so that's the those are the two worst ones as far as you know how they didn't answer because they tend to evade and most of and the the three problems that he's having they all tended to evade the the one that actually it's 23 hours. is the worst for me out of all of this is actually Joe Biden's pick for attorney general is uh, Merrick Garland. Now, if you know who Merrick Garland is, is good for you. But if you don't, Merrick Garland was the person that Barack Obama chose to replace Antonin Scalia when Scalia died on the, uh, to replace him on the Supreme Court when Scalia died. And Republicans at the time said, fuck no, we are not letting Barack Obama choose someone to replace Antonin Scalia. Not going to happen. And so they left the seat open for, for a year 
until Trump got elected, and then Trump put uh, Neil Gorsuch on the court. So Merrick Garland is now, he's a D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals judge. He's been a judge for a long time. Now he's up for attorney general, which is fine. On paper, Merrick Garland, when I heard the name, I was like, that's about as good as I can get from a Joe Biden. You know, that's that's probably as good as I can get as attorney general. That sounds good to me. He has been awful. Merrick Garland has been terrible in his, uh, you know, in his confirmation hearing. He's he he's terrible at this. He stumbles over a lot. He 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 he, he does that a lot. You would think someone with you know decades of experience in the public sector, you know, as a judge, as a you know, as a judge, I believe he worked as a a prosecutor in the Justice Department. I mean, he's he's got a lot of experience, but he you know, he fumbles over himself during the the hearings. It's it's really uncomfortable. I mean, he, I mean, honestly, he sounds like me. Now, this guy's in his 70s, I believe. So he should sound like me. He should be more polished. I mean, and I've seen him do like um, moot court things where he's helping college students uh, tackle a, a serious case or something like that. He, I mean, he's he's actually really personable. He's really, he seems a really nice guy. But he, he comes off as someone who's trying to hide something. Like some, he... He's trying to answer these questions knowing that if he says what's going to, what he plans to do as attorney general, he will lose not just Republican votes, because I don't think Republicans are going to vote for him anyway, but he'll lose those votes and he might lose some Democrat votes too. So he comes across as a little shady because of how much he stammers and stutters and tries and trips over himself, but he also just gives bad answers. I mean, again, on paper, to me, on paper, this was Biden's best pick out of all of his cabinet positions. On paper, this guy was a prosecutor. This guy was it is a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. He was uh, chosen. He was nominated to be on the Supreme Court. Never got confirmed. I mean, he on paper is a great pick. I like I said, I thought. Joe Biden doing it was genius. I thought it was great. I was like, okay, great. This is about as good as we're going to get from Joe Biden for attorney general. Perfect. But he was asked like, you know, what, you know, he couldn't even answer if coming into the country illegally is against the law. Is it illegal to cross the border illegally? I mean, he refused, he didn't, he evaded that question. I mean, how do you and his his actual words were senator i haven't really thought about it you've been a fucking federal judge for at least 10 years i think it's longer i think it might be like 20 years you've been at least you've been a judge for 20 years you're telling me you've never thought about whether or not a, a, a an illegal immigrant is breaking the law by being here illegally you've never considered that at all in your day-to-day life you've never had a case before you where you've had to make the assumption or make the consideration he's not in a position to be a judge if he was if this was a confirmation hearing for him to be on a federal judge a federal uh court of appeals sure yeah you hem and haw like oh you know i don't really know i I don't want to prejudge that's great Dude, you're you're going to be attorney general. This is finally a time where you can say, "Oh yeah, it's it's totally illegal." But whether you know how we're going to enforce that's going to be a little bit different under the Biden administration, under my leadership in the Department of Justice, than it will be in uh, than it would have been on the previous administration. There you go. There's your answer. But no, he had to evade it. Same thing uh, when asked about the Durham investigation. Durham investigation is an investigation started under Donald Trump, the Trump administration, to find out what happened with the whole Russian collusion hoax. Because we know that um, Russia collusion was a complete waste of time and a complete farce. And it was started, the whole, the whole start of the investigation was based off of phony information that should have never been allowed in the first place. 
should have never been used as, as information to, to justify warrants. So that, uh, that is an investigation that's still ongoing, I believe. I think Durham might have resigned because I think he sees the writing on the wall. Merrick Garland was asked, hey, are you going to keep the, the Durham investigation going? Or are you going to squash it? Wouldn't answer. Evaded that as well. Wouldn't commit to it. And, you know, again, I, I think it's just because, like, I, you know, I'm probably going to kill it. I mean, he couldn't say that out loud. And then the, the worst one, to me, and this is from a pure policy perspective, Merrick Garland says, uh, when asked, again, I think this is all being asked by Ted Cruz, will will the Department of Justice try to overturn the uh, Second Amendment DC versus Heller decision? Will you try, will you actively participate in cases that try to overturn the, the the Heller decision, which guarantees a a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, an individual right anyway? And again, non-committal, wouldn't say anything. So the answer is yes. Then on that one, you have to assume that. So overall, think of everything I've gone over over the last forty-five minutes. Joe Biden launches airstrikes. He's killing jobs. He his the the two governors from the most populous liberal states, California and New York, are wrapped up in scandals and and problems right now in their states. I mean, you have Cuomo. I mean, even New York Democrats are saying we should impeach him or he needs to resign. Uh, there's a recall effort in California. So there's all of that going on. Then on top of that, his probably his three most high profile cabinet picks, uh, they all suck. At least at the confirmation hearing por- portion. They are terrible. So this has been a terrible first five weeks or so of the the Biden administration. And I really don't know how this is going to go going forward. So I'll probably go over. I know today is the final day of CPAC, the conservative political action committee um, meeting that happened in Florida. I haven't watched any of it because I'm going to watch it all between now and Wednesday. And I'm going to do the, uh, I'll record the podcast on Wednesday, and I'll give you my take. That's going to be all CPAC. I'm going to go over everything. Um, obviously, Trump's speech. Uh, I'll focus a little bit on two two people that are I thought were the biggest deal: uh, Governor Ron DeSantis and Governor Kristi Noem, uh, Florida and South Dakota, uh, respectively. So I'm going to really focus on them. If anybody else kind of stands out as somebody, I think, hey, keep an eye on this person. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about them as well, but it's going to be all CPAC on my next show. But the f- these last five weeks for Joe Biden, he's been awful. I mean, he didn't even tell Kamala Harris about the airstrikes. How, how pathetic is that? So, <laughs> I mean, she is, she's going to be completely useless until Joe gets kicked out of office or dies or, or resigns for mental health issues or something like that. She's going to be completely useless until she becomes president. And it's, it's pretty sad. So, I'm done politics for right now. I'm done, I'm done with those. What I wanted to go over now, again, I try to stick a cultural event or a, some sort of cultural thing into these podcasts because I don't want to just talk politics. Politics are kind of my forte. They're they're what I I talk about online mostly. So I don't like just talking about them because everyone has their own opinions. Opinions are like assholes. Everybody has them and they all stink. So what I what I really want to go over though right now is uh is actually a video game. I I actually was uh I bought this when it first came out or I got it for Christmas. I believe I got it for Christmas. Uh, it's uh, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is by far the best video game I've ever played. So if you have a different video game than that, you're wrong. Uh, so <laughs> that's the bottom line. This video game is great. It First of all, when I got it, I just started at a new job after 
after you know basically i <laughs> i took some risks on some jobs and they did not pan out and so i was kind of starting from scratch all over and so i got this for christmas it was a it's a it's a really fun game but i got to play it right after my son was born my son was only about three or four months old and when i got the game what i would do is i would sit my son down and you know if my my wife needed to take a nap you know obviously she was you know still getting used to being a mom i would just put my son down on the on the floor in the den he would watch he would basically watch me i watch me he was you know four year old just doing his thing learning how to roll over and i would just play and he actually now now that he's about three four years old he he actually watches me play he'll come over and be like daddy play daddy play and so he likes watching me go and like beat up some of the characters and stuff so he likes it and so it's 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 fun i get to kind of reconnect with my son a little bit it's like yeah i played this when you were a baby and now you like it now so that's great but let me go over the game with you itself the game is so good so right from the very beginning it kind of captures your attention because you're like whoa what's going on here this is kind of weird and this is from someone who while i played some of the the previous zelda games going back to the old school original nes so i played that zelda game but you have to remember i was you know i was only like seven eight years old that game actually for a seven or eight year old at the time i remember it's kind of confusing you know my my mom didn't buy that for me so i borrowed it from a friend and then it, it just i wasn't sure how to really play it so so i never really got into zelda that much but i played this game and it catches your attention right away so the graphics are really good obviously but the it starts off great in that you you learn the the tutorial of the game that teaches you how to play is actually part of the game. So it just seems like a mission that you have to complete in the game. It's not this, it's not this, oh, you do it this this way, and then you do this this way. And this whole separate thing that's kind of separate from the game, it's actually a part of the game. And so it just kind of weaves it right in. So you learn how to play the game, you learn the necessities of the game as while you're playing the game so there's no there's no separation of that and that's really cool because you're just like oh i'm in the game and once you get done with that first part of the game you're like that was a tutorial that was basically a tutorial you realize it because you're basically on this plateau area this high mountainous area where if you were to try to jump off the edge you're gonna die and the whole purpose of the uh of completed the missions on this plateau area is that you're trying to get like a hand glider so you can glide down off of it so it's it's really it's really good how it you know incorporates you into the game really quick and i mean that first part takes i mean when you're first playing it it took me a couple of days just to get off of that i mean well not a couple of days but i mean i played for like like about an hour then i played for another hour and so it did take it took me a couple of days because remember i had a three four month old kid so it was great and all so that's just the the first part it's it's really great and and the end of that tutorial portion it tells you kind of the story it kind of you know really sets the tone for the story that it's telling for the game so there's that so remember i'm talking about the tutorial the tutorial is already great so if and that's that's just the beginning that's your first you know 30 to 45 minutes of gameplay right there if you're just sitting down like i'm gonna make this happen you're talking 30 to 45 minutes of gameplay right there and it's great on top of that the level of detail that went into this game is is crazy i mean you don't really realize it until you've actually completed all of the the side quests and you completed all of the uh, all the shrines there's a bunch of shrines that have like separate missions once you've completed all the shine uh the side quests then you really start to realize how much detail goes into this there are characters on one side of the map that tell you about a mission on the other side of the map there's um there there are 
Well, for example, there's a mountain that is named after one of the creators, uh, game designers at Nintendo, and he died during the uh, while they were doing this game, while they're um, trying to complete this game. So they named a, a mountain after him, and then they created a character that is basically in honor of him. So it's really cool that when you look that up, that's really kind of cool. But the level of detail is is just astonishing i i really wish i could give it justice by talking i think what i might do one of these days is if i get enough subscribers i might just you know sit down and like you know tell the wife like hey what i'm gonna do is i'm going to start over on a game of uh on a game of breath of the wild and just live stream it for you know like 10 or 12 hours straight you know, just stop to go pee, basically. So I might do that if I get enough subscribers and, you know, you guys make it worth my time. But, yeah, the level of detail is just fantastic. Uh, now, another thing, too, is I like the, I like open world maps. And that's what this is. This is just a, an open world area. The, uh, the game does kind of guide you in a direction it wants you to go but you're under no obligation to do that you're not penalized for it there's no glitches to be found for example i really love the game fallout 4 i think so far from the fallout games i've played it's the best of the fallout series it's uh it's really glitchy though and if if you don't follow things in the right order kind of it's i don't it, it gets kind of clunky you know the the gameplay doesn't really work in some circumstances. This You don't have that issue in Breath of the Wild. If you decide to go on a completely different tangent and do your own mission, your own, this is how I want to do the game, that's perfectly fine. The game doesn't penalize you for it at all. There's no, there's no oh, you messed this up and this is, you know, this, this bit of dialogue or this bit of, you know, this bit of dialogue you have with this uh, NPC doesn't match. Everything matches up. Everything works out fine. So that's what I mean about the level of detail that goes into this is that you can create your own adventure and there's no there's nothing in the game that kind of penalizes you for it in any way. So but if you are someone who's like, well, I'm gonna kind of st- let me see where the where the creators want me to go and I'll follow that. That's fine too, because I actually started out that way the first uh first time I played, I said, well. Where does this game want me to go? Let me just try that. And it's actually, you know, it does make it easier to learn because you run into a lot of a lot of enemies that are easy to beat up when you still have shitty weapons. And so it helps you learn. And then you pick up little things here and there. It's actually really nice. So you can follow that. Once I beat the game the first time, I went through and said, well, I'm going to play it again. And since I knew all the secrets, I went and said, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go this route and make it easier on myself. And here's the thing, is when I try to make it easier on myself, it's it's faster, yeah, it makes it quicker, but it's not any easier because you are still this person who has shitty weapons and shitty armor, and you're just doing your best to fight off these, these you know, these bad guys, you know, all these monsters, And it's, you know, you're, if you're not following the game, you're going into areas where they're, the the monsters are more difficult to kill. So it's not any easier. It does end up being quicker. Uh, You have, there is a lot of strategy involved in this because as you start building your character up, you have to decide, do you want to have more stamina ability where you can run away or climb or swim longer or do you want to increase your defense, your 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 life, basically? Do you want to increase your defense abilities? So there is some strategy involved in this. It's uh, but bottom line, it is just a fun game to go through and just you know whoop some ass. And like I said, it's it's there's so much detail in it that you, you never. I I really it took me almost a full year to get sick of playing it after I got it and I, I was playing it, you know, at least a couple hours a day. And I, I've got to say it was a, you know, I never really got sick of playing it at all. 
So, and now my son likes to watch me play it because there are these uh, robots called Guardians, and he he's always robot, robot. And when I go and beat up a robot, as soon as the robot dies, he's like, "Yay!" So he he likes watching all that. So it's it's fun watching being able to play it now that my son is into it a little bit, and my daughter's a little bit into it now too. She's only a year old, but. Uh, my wife likes the game as well. I've been trying to get some friends into it. So like, I, it's hard for me to talk about this to, to some of my closest friends because, I mean, they have kids too. And I'll tell you right now, this is a game that you shouldn't play if you have young kids because you'll get hooked and you will neglect your kids or you'll be tempted to neglect your kids. So it is that good. I do recommend that if you have the time, if you have the ability, definitely get Breath of the Wild. Um it is a it's a really good game for a lot of different reasons i like i said if i get to a point where i uh, you know i get enough subscribers or enough interest i will probably just sit down like i said maybe 12 hours straight and just live stream me doing a uh uh just playing through starting from scratch and just playing through and you can see my strategy on the game as i go through the gameplay now however you know that's that's the best thing about this game though is that's what I love about open world maps is that you create your own adventure and but here's the thing is this one as far as the open world adventure you are even though the game does want you to go in a certain direction there's no penalty for doing your own thing and there is in a lot of other games for example for example Fallout 4 there are uh, there are areas where the the enemies are harder to kill and the game basically wants you to stay you know kind of stay in your area until you level up and then you can kind of slowly go out and slowly go out whereas in breath of the wild if you don't follow the the game it's like okay it's a little bit more difficult but you can still do it it's not a real penalty at all and it doesn't cause any glitches to to screw up the storyline for you at all either so that's my recommendation. Breath of uh, Game, uh, not Game of Thrones. Uh, Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild uh, on the Nintendo Switch. I recommend it to everybody, regardless of age. It's uh, you know I'm pushing forty, and I still think it's a great game. So, if you're into video games, I definitely recommend it. If uh, if you're not into video games and maybe you're laid up for a couple of months, go get it. Trust me, it'll be worth it. But that's all I have time for today. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in again. I'm going to be back on Wednesday. I'll probably drop the, the video either Wednesday night or Thursday Thursday night. I'm not sure yet. It's going to be all political, all CPAC. I'm going to be doing the, I'm going to go in over all of the, the information about CPAC, Trump's speech. I'll go over Ron DeSantis and Christy Noem's speech. Those, uh, those are the three speeches that I thought were the biggest deal, uh, especially with a COVID. Um, this is a COVID uh, CPAC, the first real COVID CPAC. And then, you know, I'll go over that. If there's anybody else's speech that, that kind of said, Hey, you should look at this person. I'll go over that as well. So it's going to be all CPAC next time. So definitely tune in for that. I make sure you, you know, smash the like button, like, share, subscribe, get my stuff out there. I'm on rumble. I'm on YouTube. I have a, a Twitter page at uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter at Heathen Kirk. Go ahead and look that up. And yeah, just make sure you're tuning in. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time.